marketing is essential to um, survival, stability, and growth of a practice. Episode 131. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I've gone up to beautiful Cambridge. I had a little road trip and I went to an absolutely uh, gorgeous coffee shop called Hot Numbers Coffee, where I sat and spoke with marketing consultant and co-editor at Cambridge Architecture, Susie Lober. And it was brilliant to be able to pick her brains and get some of her 18 years of experience of developing and implementing successful marketing strategies for architects. I mean, she, since 2014, she's been running uh, Low Marketing, which is a specialist marketing agency uh, and communication support for architects. Um, prior to that, she was actually the communications manager and an associate at Foster's and Partner. So she was able to really bring a broad uh, and deep perspective on the architectural industry and a lot of insights into how marketing and comms work, both from a larger practice perspective and from her experience uh, working at low marketing with smaller practices and how they best can communicate their message. So sit back, relax and enjoy Susie Loba. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Susie, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Thank you. Here we are in a gorgeous sunny afternoon in Cambridge in a wonderful coffee shop Your home in your hometown. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. So you are a marketing consultant and specialist. You've worked with many architects. You've worked for Fosters. You've, so you've got the experience of large practice. And now you run your own uh, agency working with small to medium enterprises. So how did you get started? How did you, how did you get involved in uh, marketing specifically for architects? I, I read history, actually. I read history at Nottingham. Then I took a gap year to go traveling. And during that gap year to fund it, I found myself working as a team secretary in an architecture practice. And I come from a creative family, and I loved it. I loved working with architects. I was writing up drawing schedules and site meeting notes and filing drawings for a big refurbishment project in the city. Uh, 41 Lothbury. Right. Um, and I, that really got me hooked on the process of construction and seeing a building develop from concept onto site. So after my travels, I rejoined the, pra the practice and um, I took on their marketing. So I decided to do a postgraduate course with the Chartered Institute of Marketing. And I've been working mostly with architecture practices for almost 20 years now. Wow. And so you, how did you get involved with Fosters? I had a number of different in-house roles. I've, I've worked for small, medium, large practices, those specializing in public sector work, private sector work, international, domestic. And my last in-house role was managing the comms team in Foster and Partners. Right. And when did you set up your agency? 
three years ago, right. I set up Low Marketing. Um, it's not just the first two letters of my surname. <laughs> low means um, to draw attention to wonderful things, right. as in lo and behold, ah. which is a lot of what my work is about. And so for you, what is marketing? Marketing is all the activities that help you get better clients and get more of the kind of work that you want. And what sorts of struggles do you see or obstacles do you think architects kind of face with their, with their marketing? I don't like to, to generalize. Everybody has their different likes and, and dislikes. Um, but most architects didn't get into architecture to do sales and marketing. Yeah. You know, you want to be designing buildings. Um, and the idea of sales and self-promotion can feel quite uncomfortable. Um, the idea of doing things like networking and public speaking and writing about your work. Um, I think architects would often rather stab themselves in the eye than write a <laughs> press release. <laughs> And yeah, well, it, it kind of, you know, from my perspective, my, with my architect ha hat on, marketing often gets reduced down to brochures, websites, photography. And obviously those are intrinsic parts of marketing for any architecture practice, but it's actually a, a lot deeper than that. And there is a larger kind of context for how you're communicating with your, with your clients. So when you start working with a practice, what's the sort of first thing that you typically tend to work on or that you experience that's missing in a practice with their marketing? Marketing is essential to um, survival, stability and growth of a practice. And it really all starts with having a clear vision of where you want to go and how you're going to get there. So good marketing comes from having a clear vision and also knowing your clients knowing where they are, what their concerns, what their priorities are. And every marketing decision that you make should stem, should stem from that. But actually, the whole process of marketing is so much wider than just social media or brochures or a website. It can have a really fundamental role in how your practice develops. What sorts of activities would you consider a marketing that are often not... You, we wouldn't think that's marketing. Yeah, so often I'll go in and I'll talk to a practice and they'll say, oh, we don't do marketing. We're really bad at marketing. But then as the conversation develops, they might talk about academic papers they've written or presentations they've given or how they're particularly vocal on Twitter around a, a certain issue. And all these issues, all these relationship building issues are all marketing activities, even if you don't want to give them the label of marketing. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting because then it becomes marketing, uh, becomes a kind of extension of the creative design process. And we can start, when, I know architects, when we start talking about writing about architecture, we can relate to that as being, you know, that's another expression of architectural process. And actually, you know, when it's uh, put into a public forum or is available to other people, particularly our clients, then it's, you know, it kind of enters into the realm of what might be known as marketing. Um, so for you, what's the sort of strategic process that you engage with when you first work with a practice? To begin with, I would work on the, the vision, the strategic vision of where the practice is now, where they ultimately want to get to, yeah. um, and then really develop a strategy to help them use marketing tools in order to get there. So it's not necessarily just about growth. Mm. Marketing is also about creating stability. It's about getting you better clients. It's about getting you the kind of work that you want. It's also about attracting and retaining staff. Um, so I would always begin with sort of establishing what the practice vision is um, and then work out how to best utilize all the different tools you have available to you with marketing to help you achieve those goals. So when you say it, it's important for maintenance and survival and retaining staff, how, how can marketing be used to uh, facilitate those types of parts of the business? I think at, as a practice, you may well be looking to grow, but also you might be thinking, I'm quite comfortable where we are. We've got good projects, we've got good clients. Um, that doesn't mean to say you can afford to turn your back on marketing. 
It doesn't mean to say you should sh shut down and stop marketing the practice. And also, marketing has um, a really critical role to play in developing a strong... Marketing has a critical role to play in developing a strong practice culture and bringing your staff with you and attracting staff to a practice and also retaining the talent um, within a practice as well. It was interesting, you were saying earlier about how um, in marketing that you call it tools for advocacy. Yes. So this yeah. is when, you, when you've got very sort of strong internal communication. Uh, what does that allow for, what, what does that mean, tools for advocacy? There are, there are two aspects of marketing and often we only perceive marketing to be these outward facing activities. Right. But actually internal marketing is just as important. Um, that can get quite difficult within a large practice to bring everybody with you on that journey, to have that same vision. And it's essential that any architect, whether you're a team of five people or whether you're a team of 500 people, everybody in the practice understands what is the vision, what are the USPs, what are the key projects, and what are you offering to clients. And how do you go about defining those, those things, particularly as a small practice? Because that's often a conversation that, would, I don't know, is it quite difficult to, to do that if you're in it so intensely? Yes, it can be. Um, it, it varies widely, as we were saying. So if, you, if you're a one-man band that has just started out, then hopefully you've got a really clear vision of why you are doing that, where you want to get to. But if you're a practice on your fourth or fifth generation of partners with eight different partners pulling in different directions, that can be a lot more tricky. Um, I think the advantage of working with an external consultant like me is you can come in with a fresh pair of eyes mm. and have a higher level of objectivity about it to help really crystallize what the vision and strategy is. And, and so I'm quite interested in, in understanding you know, your experience in terms of having worked at a, a practice like Foster's, obviously one of these kind of uh, really important architectural businesses in the UK and if not in, in the world. What were the sorts of things that they did marketing-wise that lots of other practices can learn from and how does, what role does marketing play in a, in a large organization as opposed to how it plays in, in smaller architectural practices? With a large practice, there's a lot of mouths to feed, so necessarily there's a big emphasis on bidding. You know, at Foster's, right. I might be managing 20 different bid documents going out in a week all over the world, and they could vary massively from a well-worded covering letter to lever arches full of tender responses to OG questions. Um, and necessarily, there is a, a big emphasis on, on bidding. That can sometimes be to the detriment of the other sort of softer methods of marketing that aren't necessarily directly attributable to new work. So what, what is the process of bid writing? Bidding is really, you know, it's about any of those opportunities where you're seeking and responding to opportunities to work. So it can vary massively. You know, it could be a well-worded covering letter. It could be a lever arch is full of very technical, specific responses to OG questions. Um, and for a big practice, that, that's where they put a lot of their time and effort, necessarily. You know, they've got a lot of mouths to feed. And at Foster's, I could be spending my time managing maybe 20 different bid documents, bid documents a week. Um, I work a lot with clients on just helping them to, to shape what they want to say, shape their offer, and make sure that, uh, that where they're in a situation where there is a, a document that they've got to respond to, that they are actually ask, answering the question, you know, answering the exam question, um, and not just getting carried away saying what, what you want to say, um, and actually responding in, in the right way in a sort of, in a tailored way to that client's requirements. Mm. Yeah, I was, so that kind of leads on to what, what, are the, what makes a successful bid and what is what are the lots of mistakes that architects will make when bid writing leaving it to the last minute always 
<laughs> you know, midnight the night before, it's not the best time to be, to be polishing and refining your text. Um, not answering the question. Um, those are the most sort of the, the, common, the common problems. I think that the best bids are the ones that are really, really tailored to the client's requirements. Um, and also the, 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 best, the best approaches are really the ones where somehow they are part of a process which has fostered a, a broader conversation with that client. So it, that, that bid document is not hitting somebody's desk cold. You've already had a conversation, whether a telephone conversation or a meeting or something, that has just put you that little edge ahead of your competitors, hopefully. Mm. Brilliant. What, what sorts of uh, challenges do you see smaller practices having with producing that kind of level of quality marketing collateral, if you like? Because I suppose there's a, there's a different way. We were talking earlier about the sort of the languages of the client and that fosters uh, very good at being able to communicate these ideas very specifically to who their target demographic is. Whereas sometimes, you know, architects, as a generalization, you know, we get accused of archie babble and talking about glazed apertures and, and it, yeah. in a language that doesn't always necessarily resonate. How, how can we be very effective in making sure that our message lands? Good marketing always starts with understanding your clients. Right. Understand where they are, what are their priorities, what are their concerns, and speak to those. And I think um, an excellent tool for this, actually, is carrying out client interviews and conducting post-occupancy evaluation. And that's something that I'm quite interested in doing with clients, is going out and speaking to their clients as an independent third party once a project is completed and discuss what has worked well, what didn't work so well, how was the process for them. And that is such an effective tool mm. at then driving your future marketing because it gives you the vocabulary of how to talk to your clients in a way that they will understand and taps into what their concerns are. When you say uh, it gives you the vocabulary, can you expand upon that a little bit? It's really about communicating as clearly as you possibly can um, what your USPs are. Uh, depending on the, the, the level of client, a lot of clients don't really understand what an architect does, what they can bring to a project, what value they add to a project. And so you need to start from the basics, really, um, in explaining what it is that an architect does. Um, obviously, there are more informed clients who are doing several, several projects, but an awful lot of your client base will probably be first-time clients. Mm. And what's the difference between... I mean, obviously, like in, in a practice like Foster's, you're dealing with more sophisticated clients who perhaps have done... Um, many many delivered many many projects and perhaps of a smaller practice if you're dealing particularly if you're dealing with residential this might be their one and only projects what are the similarities in terms of how you communicate there are a lot of similarities really the, the key is to be clear be concise and just communicate as clearly as you possibly can what do you find architects like or dislike about marketing for, for a lot of architects, marketing is often something that slips to the bottom of the pile. Mm. Um, I don't like to generalize. Everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. But architects are mostly visual. And when it comes to writing about their work, um, writing a press release, they can be a little bit more reluctant. I think for some, um, you know, some people absolutely hate networking, for example. Um, and I think largely that's because it's perceived as giving up your evening to stand in a room full of men in suits and swap business cards and make small talk. And that just seems utterly horrific. Yeah. But actually, that's not all networking is. You know, it's, I think the, the, the podcast you did with Rachel and Louise was really interesting, looking at emotional intelligence and, and the blockers to this. But also networking is anything that lifts your head above the work that you're working on and gets you outside the office. So it could be 
attending a talk on something you're interested in. It could be doing a building tour. Um, there's a lot of networking done online now as well through, you know, LinkedIn is a fantastic mm. platform. Um, so there's lots of other ways you can approach it. Some practices, you know, they really hate public speaking and they'll come to me and say, I will absolutely not do public speaking ever. And that is absolutely fine. You know, that's fine. You've got to find the marketing activities that, that work for you. Because if you're not enjoying it, you won't make yourself. Right. You won't make yourself do it. And consistency is key. What are the kind of clients that you love working with? All sorts, really. Yeah, all sorts. I think one of the things that I love about working at a consultancy level is it's so much more varied than being in-house. Yeah. So I'm involved in a massive range of different projects. And I tend to work in three different areas. So mostly I work in strategy, content, and research. So strategy is all about that piece of working with a practice to create a vision and work out the ways that their marketing can be impactful and drive them towards their business goals. But content creation mm. is a lot of what I do. So whether that is helping with bid writing, website development, publicity, all the different areas around creating content. And then the third aspect is about research. I guess as a historian, I'm probably quite naturally drawn to research. But um, it's really interesting working with clients to explore new sectors, different areas they can get into. And I also really enjoy working with clients on post-occupancy evaluation, yeah. carrying out client surveys, talking to clients on an architect's behalf as a neutral party about how a, how a project panned out. I'm, I live near Cambridge, so there's an awful lot of really exciting development and growth happening around here. Um, and I love being involved with projects where I'm actually going to see, see the project development. I mean, it was fantastic at Foster's to be involved in some really high-profile projects like 425 Park Avenue and the Apple Campus, but I'm not likely to go and see those. Yes. So it's really nice to be working on projects that are part of my community. And what, what are sorts of forms of marketing content that architects can do that perhaps we wouldn't think of as marketing? Often when I go and speak to a practice, they'll say, oh, we, we don't do marketing, we're really bad at marketing. But then as the conversation develops, they'll say, oh, but we have written these academic papers and actually one of our directors is giving a talk next week about this particular niche issue around conservation. And as things evolve, most practices are quite good at marketing, but they just don't call it that. Yes. And what would you, I mean, it's interesting when we, when we talk about larger practices and, you know, we can kind of look at Fosters or Rogers or these big, big organizations and think, well, they've got huge marketing budgets. Do they face some of the same problems that smaller practices face? Yeah, absolutely. I think people might be surprised at the fact that even large practices still face those issues of trying to break into new sectors, for example. You know, architects often want to explore new areas. They want to apply their skills to, to new sectors, whether they're a, a huge practice or whether they're a tiny practice. Mm. And face exactly the same issues of demonstrating relevant experience in that, in that area. And when, when you're, say, perhaps working with an organization to move into a new sector, what are the most important things to be considering about how you present yourself? Again, it comes back to knowing the clients. So right. it's got to start with listening. Before you start trying to pitch your skills in a new sector, you need to be listening to what is going on in that sector. What are the key concerns of those clients? And... It starts with listening and research, but there are a lot of transferable skills mm. that you can apply to any different building type. So partly it's about educating a client on what an architect does, what is the value that they bring, and how that is applicable to their project. And when you say listening, how can we become better listeners in a marketing sense? 
Um, there's a couple of things that, that you, you could do. You know, firstly, go to events, go to talks, go to exhibitions and conferences and just talk to as many people as you can and listen to what the issues are. Um, work your network. So, you know, find out who is working in this sector that you already know and talk to them. Mm. And then, you know, you've got that massive resource of social media. They're ready and free. Um, but use it carefully, you know, start by listening. They're called social networks for a reason. And in social media, there's a, there's a rule of thirds that a third of your time should be spent listening and a third should be spent promoting yourself and right. then a third can be spent on curating and sharing information from others. Ah, that's interesting. And when you say listening, obviously it's not kind of mindless consuming, but listening with, with intent to try and understand what are the emotional pains of potential clients and, yeah. and prospects, being yeah. able to present your... And I think this is interesting when it starts to talk about um, the move away from architects being, you know, trying to, like the, the classic kind of advertising, here's my services, here's my scales, but actually being one of an educator, being, yeah. being one of an, uh, of, of an expert. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious to ask, actually, when you were working with clients like in Foster's, what for you, I mean, Norman Foster's worked with people like Steve Joggs, um, Michael Bloomberg, these kind of sort of titans of various industries. These are very sophisticated clients and sort of incredible entrepreneurs. What was the, what makes Foster's so good at being able to talk to those types of clients? What's, what are the skill sets there that you can kind of distill? I think something that Foster's understands and does exceptionally well is understanding the value of design communication. Right. Really understanding the importance of communicating clearly what the vision of the practice is and what the value you bring to a project is. Why is it important for architects to have a long-term strategy with their marketing? Marketing is it's, long, it's a long-term investment. There are very few things that marketing can offer a, a magic bullet for. You need to commit and be consistent and really stick at it. It's so easy to get into project work and the day-to-day -day running of your practice that you know, marketing just slips to the bottom of the list. And then when the projects come to a stop or stall, as they sometimes do, you suddenly realize that where's your next opportunity coming from and why isn't the phone ringing? And with marketing, you need to be constantly, you know, every week, every month doing something. I really advocate a sort of little and often approach mm. to marketing. And that is an area where working with an external consultant, if you cannot afford to have a, a sort of in-house marketing specialist working with an external consultant like myself can be actually a much more affordable and efficient way to achieve that momentum than than you might think and for example if you if you're a practice and you don't have completed projects you, you don't have uh, perhaps the projects that you want to be showing off is there anything that you can market what other things could you market yeah absolutely oh. there is still so much that you can do. You know, there's, there's stuff that you can, can share about. People actually, generally people love seeing the, the process. You know, they like the uh, following a project from drawing board to, to being on site. To what are the issues that you're facing with a project on site? What are the, the challenges that you're tackling? What are the expertise that you bring to the planning process? There's so much that you, that you can be doing mm. um, around your, your service and your expertise if you don't have that, that big portfolio of completed projects. I guess it's one of those things that because we do it every day or we see it as not that, that interesting, we forget that how it can build a very good relationship with potential yeah. clients or existing clients and it sort of demystifies a lot of what it is that the architect does when you're able to kind of document in a concise way, you know, 
here's what we're doing with, with a planning process, here's what we're doing with, with building regulations. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's a wealth of, of content to be, to be generated from that. And you were saying earlier as well about how, how important, uh, well, for 2020 sort of future trends um, that are going to happen in, in marketing and you were saying how important video is. Yeah, yeah. I think video is, it, it has been huge and it will continue to be huge and it is such a untapped potential for architects because yeah. you're not trying to sell accountancy services. You, you've got a fantastic product and service to, to work with that is visually interesting. Um, and I'd love to see architects using, using video more, not just to talk about their projects, but to talk about the, the process and to talk about insights into what it is actually like to work with them. And what are some other 2020 trends that you see that, for marketing that architects can really capitalize on? Firstly, we live in an age of, of big data. You know, there, there's so much data available to us. You don't need to be shooting in the dark anymore, whether it's really interrogating your, your Google analytics on your website or looking at your social media metrics and insights to really get a grasp on what am I doing now, what's working, what isn't working, and then shaping your marketing accordingly. I think another area that is going to be really interesting is around voice search Voice search and also visual search, actually, I think mm. could be really interesting for architects. How does visual search work? Kind you of... can literally now um, take a photograph of a, a building or a detail oh, well, like and a then use that as, as a visual search. So, you know, that has massive potential for architects, I think. That's really interesting when we start considering how um, our potential clients will be looking for things. Like it might be they're out and about and they take a photograph Mm. Of, a, of, a, of a space or something that they like and then it will get, you know, they do a reverse image search yeah. and then you want, to be able to, you want to be in a position where you're able to capitalize on that, those modes of contact. Yeah. The way in which um, your potential clients want and expect to receive information is changing and architecture needs to keep up with that. Don't, don't get left behind. You know, AI will also have a massive impact in 2020 is a massive increase in chatbots, for example, used on social media platforms and on websites. And it's something like 80% of, of clients now expect to get information here and now, and if they don't, they'll move on. So architecture needs to, to keep pace with a fast-changing marketing environment. For you as a, market, uh, a marketer, has the speed of social media and the internet really revolutionize the way marketing is done nowadays? Do old forms of marketing still work? There are, there's no denying that, that social media has had a huge impact and, and the potential is massive. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that other platforms aren't relevant. Mm. It's important to remember that social media is it's just one platform, it's just one marketing channel. And other streams like newsletters and events and publicity, they're all still just as relevant. And so I suppose there isn't like a, a magic bullet, as you said, of like, you know, do this one thing and it works. Yeah. And perhaps that's sometimes, you know, marketing is often, it's a test. So you, you do need to be able to test ideas and see what they, what they work at. How would you um, advise, a, say, a, a young practice or a smaller practice, they're very limited perhaps in terms of their time and being able to put into marketing research and resources and perhaps they've got a limited budget what would be some of the most impactful things that they could do set a real clear vision of where you're trying to get to yeah and let that inform every other marketing decision that you make again i'll go back to this keep reiterating this listen to your clients yeah be where they are and talk in in a language and talk to their concerns I would say get on social media, sort your website out, and get networking. Get out there. Um, and actually, you, you might find that working with somebody external can actually be more efficient than you think it, than you think it might be. So, for example, two of the services that I offer are either a one-off audit 
of either a website or a social media platform where I'll just come in, look at one very specific issue, and then just give you a really plain speaking approach to, you know, how you can tackle that. The other thing that I will, I will do is also I work with practices on a sort of marketing strategy level. So offering a, a month, just a monthly marketing strategy call just to keep them, just to keep them on target, which mm. is quite a, a low cost effective way. So you carry out the marketing. You've actually got to do the tasks and implement it. And I'll just sort of call in once a month and be there as a sounding board to, to develop that, which works quite well for, for start out practices who can't afford a sort of outsourced marketing department. Yeah. And it kind of gives a, a, a helping them keep to their yeah. strategic map, if yeah. you like. What are some of the common mistakes architects make with their websites? So many architects' websites look the same. They're so boring. The logo's in the top left corner, the, the menu's on the top right-hand side, and then they have the big splash hero images of the beautifully completed project. And there's no clear call to action. What do you actually want somebody to do when they visit your website? Do you want them to pick up the phone and call you? Do you want them to look at your project portfolio? There's no clear call to action or journey. And so many websites are just online brochures of, of projects. They don't actually speak to the issues that clients have or the concerns that they might have, like how do I get planning permission or you know, what are the issues with refurbishing a listed building? They just present a series of completed projects. And also, I think another area is that often architects don't really use Google Analytics. The information is there for you. Um, so, yeah, dig into it and see what you can find. What, it might surprise you to see what are the most visited pages of your, of your website. What mistakes or what challenges do you see with architects writing their kind of bios or how you they like a practice sort of a practice profile about us yes yeah um that can, it, can, it can be quite difficult there's a lot of terms that, that always come up you know we're a, an award-winning design-led practice and they can sound quite generic people really want to know the people that they're going to be working with they want to know what your approach is what are you like as a person you know don't don't be afraid, even if you're a big organization, to get some personality across, I think. What has been one of your favorite examples of like innovative marketing for a small practice? Um, an example I came across uh, this Christmas, actually, was um, related to the bored, tired old, tired old practice Christmas card. Because nobody does Christmas cards, right, anymore. It's, it's unsustainable and it's wasteful and re really boring. But what this practice had done, had, they'd done a, a digital card and they'd taken, um, they'd made it into like a little a sort of quiz thing where you had to guess which member of the team was, was doing what. And it really promoted a lot of engagement because it was fun. You know, it was fun and it got people talking and there was a little prize at the end for the person who who got it right. And what I really liked about that campaign is that it was fun and it generated engagement. Um, and there's so much potential now with, with marketing and the sort of data-driven environment that we mm. live in to be able to do really, really personalized marketing that can really drive engagement and conversations with your prospective audiences. Yeah, and we're very much able to do a lot of research on, say, even individuals, things like LinkedIn. You can kind of go onto somebody's profile nowadays and you can find out a personal interest of theirs. Do you, do you recommend this? Do you recommend going beyond the sort of traditional approaches of like presenting your work and actually talking about the things that the practice is doing and the personalities within the office yeah absolutely absolutely because it's not just about a catalogue of completed projects people want to work with people and so they want to get to know you 
they want to know something about you and, and how you work. And I see this time and time again in, in sort of social media posts that I, that I do, is the stuff that gets the best engagement, is the stuff where it's human, where a little bit of personality is shown, you know, where there's a little bit of insight into what you do when you're not in the office or what is the personality of the office. That's the thing that really drives engagement. You know, social media is called social for a reason. Yeah. So one of the one of the other projects I'm involved with is I'm a co-editor for Cambridge Architecture, which is a very well respected little publication um, by the local chapter of the ROBA. Um, and it, it's all about promoting good design and local practices. And I've really enjoyed being involved involved in that as a project. Brilliant. For you, what's next in 2020? So I will be, I work with an exclusive group of practices as an outsourced marketing department. And I do anything they need, really, and any marketing. And I'll be continuing to do that, which is great because I love those those long-term relationships where I've been working with them for, for three years, maybe more, and I'm really an embedded part of the team. Yes. So lots of exciting projects planned with those, with those practices. Um, I'm also going to be working on a bit more bid writing and um, bidding for projects. And I'll also still be continuing to offer, offer services for either one-off audits. So just going in and a kind of troubleshooting capacity over the sort of short, sharp shock for practices who just need to, I don't know, sort out their website or maybe don't have much marketing budget, but just want to use my expertise to tackle one little problem at a time. Um, and I'll also be continuing to offer my monthly marketing strategy calls. So I'm starting up with a couple of new clients doing that this year. So that'll be quite interesting, actually, just to sort of act in more of a kind of mentoring role whereby right. they will be doing the marketing and implementing the marketing themselves for budgetary reasons. And I'm just sort of providing a kind of a guiding hand to help keep them on track. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to, to working with some new clients in that way as well. Brilliant. Susie, thank you very much for being on the Business of Architecture. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to Cambridge and to giving me the opportunity. Delight. Thanks. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guest do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.